Can you think of any other word from history that's as abused as Viking? How many movies and video games and cartoons, all that have used the word Viking in a way that has nothing at all to do with history or you know, very, very lightly touches on it, but turns it into a caricature. I mean, the word knight is also abused and overused as a, you know what, pirate. Pirate is probably the closest competitor. And I mean, Vikings were partially pirates. So there you go. Before I go on, I just want to let you know that Viking Jewelry has a sale on these badass Thor's hammers right now. Very detailed, just like the other jewelry that I've shown before. And this one is really pretty. Very awesome decorations. It's got two wolves heads there. They currently do 30% off all Thor's hammers for 48 hours after this video is published with the coupon code SKULL30 and 20% off everything for 15 days with coupon code SKULL20. So check them out. I think they're well worth it. So far, I've been very impressed by every piece that they've sent me. All right, so Vikings in movies and video games come in different, shall we say, grades. The most stereotypical is something like Volgar the Viking, or technically it's Völgar, because there is the, the Swedish O with the two dots. Uh, anyway, so this is just a Nordic-themed fantasy barbarian. That's all it is. It has nothing at all to do with historical Vikings. Zero. And then there's a dude from Rune, which is vaguely historically inspired fantasy. This is about as accurate as the depiction of Japanese schoolgirls in hentai. Don't ask me how I know. And then there's Expeditions Viking, which is apparently set on planet Earth at the start of the Viking Age, but it takes substantial artistic liberties and introduces some full-on fantasy elements. Like, basically the support classes, just flat out as far as I've seen, are just nothing much historical about them. This guy looks somewhat familiar. I, I don't know. And then there's the TV show Vikings, which references historical personalities and events and has some accurate or accurate-ish weapons, but the clothing and armor is hilariously off. I mean, let's, let's see what we got here. Uh, Ring-studded vest on top of a crudely stitched BDSM jacket, leather booby armor, checkerboard leather coat, Apple pie armor, the elite neck beard guard, LARP edition. <laughs> wow, I can't even. I mean, I don't know how good the show is. I haven't watched it, but whatever it is, historically accurate, it ain't. And then there's the alternate Earth slash history sort of setting, like Mountain Blade, for example, which has the Nords, which are not supposed to be actual real life Vikings, but some of their outfits look almost exactly like accurate Viking era. Others, not so much. Okay, so let's look at actual historical Vikings, which, by the way, in case you didn't know, not all Viking-era Scandinavians were Vikings. Only the ones who went out on raids were actually called Vikings. They went a Viking. The Viking period is named after the Viking raids, obviously, although raiding was not the only thing they did. They also traded and explored, etc., etc. And it's usually set between 793, which is the sacking of the monastery at Lindisfarne, to 1066, the Battle of Hastings. So they typically wore a long sleeve knee length over tunic in a number of possible colors, or undyed for the poor, uh, made of wool or sometimes linen, uh, with a leather belt, likely with uh, belt pouches attached, an under tunic, perhaps a cloak fastened with a brooch or a pin, which were not worn in combat, by the way. A variety of pants or trousers without pockets could be either tight-fitting or baggy. There was quite a bit of variation. And uh, sometimes leg wraps, although apparently those were not common in Iceland. 
Uh, then they had simple leather shoes or boots, which were closed with toggles or tied with straps. So their outfits look very similar to Anglo-Saxons and other Viking era cultures with Germanic or Celtic origins, really. As far as helmets are concerned, the only confirmed Viking helmet in Scandinavia is the Jermenbu helmet found in Norway. Uh, they're the Valsierde and, and Vendel helmets were from the earlier Vendel period, 550 to 793. There was also a helmet found in a Viking burial in Weymouth between the early 10th and early 11th century. So we're already going toward the end of the Viking Age there. And uh, there were later nasal helmets from the 11th century. These are generally Norman. And uh, frankly, it irks me a little bit whenever people call Normans Vikings. They really weren't. I mean, they had Viking heritage, but you could basically say they were Frenchified Vikings. Some Vikings were very active in what is now France. So the Franks decided to give them some land under the condition that they would become Christians and stop being Vikings. So they eventually assimilated into Frankish culture and then became Normans. So they were not culturally Viking anymore. So why were there so few helmets? Well, one, basically. There, there are a few hypotheses. One is that they were reserved for loyalty and other high-ranking individuals, so they were rare. Uh, it could also be that they were passed or handed down from generation to generation and when they became too damaged to be usable anymore they would you know they would reuse the iron and turn those objects into something else or third maybe raiders avoided heavy armor or heavy equipment in general if you think about it if you want to strike quickly and move on quickly. You don't want to be encumbered by a lot of stuff, also on a ship. And it's also noticeable that in the earlier Vendel period, when the Scandinavians were fighting mainly on homeland, they did have more armor. There's quite a number of helmets found from that time. Speaking of armor, there's of course the male hauberk or burny from the Old Norse word brynja. Chainmail is an inaccurate term, in case you didn't know. Uh, the sagas mention those burnies fairly frequently when describing events before and after the Viking period. So, as I said, it seems that they definitely had more, not only heavier, but also more elaborate looking armor during the Vendel period for whatever reason. And there's no complete male hauberk found from the Viking period. Even fragments are relatively rare. Uh, the closest is the one in Yermenbu, which is almost complete. So it seems that during the Viking period, mail was really not very common. Uh, this could have to do with them not being able to afford it, because a lot of men who went on raid were not terribly wealthy. In fact, some of them went out on raids in order to accumulate some riches, hopefully, or you know, at least bring home some loot. So whenever you see mail on a Viking warrior, chances are there's also going to be a helmet and a sword and a shield, obviously, because uh, if you can afford a male hauberk, you're, you're most likely upper class, upper crust, if you will, and have the means to also afford other armor. By the way, there's very little evidence for lamellar armor in Viking Age Scandinavia. There are a few finds which are most likely imported from the east, but otherwise the closest thing is this coat of plates from Valsierde, which is sometimes called splint armor, but that's a bit of a dubious term. And there's also no direct evidence for padded undergarments or fabric armor. And here I have to disagree with Shad and some others who assume that Vikings used padded armor because it was common in other periods and because it's practical. It seems like a smart thing to do, which I agree with. But just because mail existed is not a guarantee that they had dedicated padded garments for use with mail or textile armor in general. I mean, winter clothing in and of itself would probably be adequate and multiple layers of clothing seem quite likely. Interestingly, in the saga of Magnus the Good, it says here, King Magnus threw off from him his coat of ring mail and had a red silk shirt outside over his clothes. So that doesn't sound like padding as such, it's just multiple layer 
of different types of clothing. There's this 10th century Anglo-Saxon image which seems to be showing a short-sleeved male hauberk over a tunic. Uh, perhaps some kind of padded jacket. It's hard to tell. It, it's, it's bulging a little bit apparently the way it's drawn. So that could be an indication of quilted padding or it could just be clothing. With depictions like that it's always highly speculative. You often don't really know what they intended to show because they weren't exactly the most uh, fantastic artists who ever existed on the face of the planet. But there are a number of other early medieval depictions that seem to show a simple tunic under mail. It does not look like thick padding anywhere there. The only other reference to this issue that, that I was able to find was an anonymous Byzantine treatise from the 6th century which says there should also be a space between the armor and the body. It should not be worn directly over ordinary clothing as some do to keep down the weight of the armor but over a garment at least a finger thick. So that makes sense to have some sort of padding but even this the source here acknowledges that at least some actually were mailed directly over their clothing. Uh, again, 6th century, so this is earlier, so gotta take everything with a grain of salt, obviously. Or a bucket, maybe. One of the stereotypes about Vikings that irk me the most, to the point of needing something a little heftier than a sword, is fur rags. Or, you know, just, just being clad in just animal skins, <laughs> that is that is not an actual historical thing. Uh, you have fur-trimmed hats, fur-lined cloaks, things like that used in winter, but they, they were not covered in fuzzy rags or fur armor, even worse. Another very wrong stereotype is Vikings with giant double-bitted axes. There is no evidence in early medieval Scandinavia for any of that. Uh, there, there are some examples of double axes from the Bronze Age. A lot of them are supposedly for ritual use. And I say supposedly because that's kind of the standard excuse of archaeologists whenever they don't really know. It's like, oh yeah, that's ritual. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, some of them may have been used as weapons. Uh, also, no two-handed swords. Sorry. People love two-handed Viking swords, but they just weren't a thing. They used single-handed swords or saxes with the shield. There was a large number of different types and variations throughout the Viking period. Uh, if you look at the, the Pedersen typology, for example, uh, they're generally straight, fairly wide double-edged blades. Uh, some single-edged blades were used in Norway, though, with a straight or upswept guard and usually large pommels, often either a triangular or sort of domed or whatever you would call this shape. Uh, sometimes a simple bar as well. And uh, late Viking swords also had Brazil nut pommels. Overall, I'd say there's enough variation that you can often give movie and video game swords that have somewhat historical settings at least a pass by you know, just kind of squinting and saying, eh, close enough. You know, except monstrosities like this. And of course there were spears and javelins also with a number of variations. Of course that's generally the most important weapon on the battlefield at the time. Not the most prestigious, that would be the sword, but certainly the most used. And that would also be what most people could afford. And by the way, apologies for not going into too much detail here. This video is getting long, so I'm, I'm trying to speed through the rest and not talk too much about each individual, individual type. Okay, so axes. Uh, axes were very common, quite often tool axes. Again, affordability is a factor here. You know, if, if you didn't have a sword, you, you would definitely have some kind of tool axe, likely several, and you could just grab that and fight with that. And quite often you can't really distinguish tool axes from battle axes, except in this case here, the Dane axe. This is a distinct combat type of axe. It has a pretty thin but very wide blade, and this is for cutting 
flesh and bone, as opposed to wood. The most iconic axe, aside from the large Dane axe, is of course the Shegerx, which translates to beard axe, but there are many other shapes. And they did not have any pole arms aside from spears and axes, so no halberds or you know, bill hooks or bardiches or anything like that. Uh, as far as bows are concerned, they did use them. Uh, the bow was mainly a hunting tool, but there are some references to battlefield use as well. You know, Vikings weren't, you know, didn't place that much emphasis on archery as opposed to, say, English longbowmen who were very prominent. And of course, in the East, you know, horse archers and all that, uh, it was not that important, but they did use them. For example, uh, during naval battles, now, when they were fighting on ships, they would shoot arrows at the other ships and throw javelins and things like that. It, there's no evidence of blunt weapons used in battle. The Vikings did not have two-handed hammers. Sorry. Mjolnir is purely mythological, most likely based on earlier hammers and axes, you know, going back to the Bronze Age and all of that. But generally for the Vikings, hammers were tools. Now, there, the closest thing is you know, the hammer pole at the end of some axes, which could be used potentially. I'm not aware of any references to using the, the blunt side of an axe in battle to strike a helmet with, but it makes a lot of sense. I'm sure they did it at least some of the time. And there was a bronze mace head found in Gotland, Sweden, around 1100, but that's basically after the Viking Age. In you know, later periods, they did use them. And also there is, interestingly, there is a throne mace depicted in the Bayeux tapestry. Uh, that was on the English side, but um, yeah. So others at the time did use maces occasionally, but not the Vikings, apparently. And finally, just a quick word about shields. The most common error that you see is Viking shields being depicted with two straps. You know, putting the arm through one strap and holding on to the other. Uh, that's a different type. You know, later Norman kite shields were used that way, but Vikings used cinder grip shields. So you have the handle right here, the, the boss covers the hand, protects it, and this is used quite a bit differently. But I've noticed lately a lot of movies and games do get that right. I mean, the, the TV show Vikings has correct shields and a, a lot of games that I've seen now do understand that this is a Viking shield. So yeah, they came in, in different sizes, you know, usually anything from about 70 centimeters to just over a meter. And uh, they were actually relatively thin and some were fairly intricately shaped. Um, it's not just simply just a board. Uh, a lot of them were actually tapered toward the edges and they were made of planks, by the way, just, just like this. They didn't have giant plywood boards that they could just cut the round shape out of. They had to make it out of separate planks and glue them together and then cover them in you know, linen or leather. Or There's a lot of debate about exactly how they, they did it, what was used to cover them. There's also constantly coming uh, new information coming in, new archaeological finds, and experimental archaeology, etc. I, I don't want to talk too much about that because um, there's, again, there's a lot of variation and disagreement. And one more thing to keep in mind is there was little or no standardization because they didn't have uh, standing armies of professional soldiers. Uh, Viking raids were basically private endeavors. There was just, you know, groups coming together deciding, okay, we, we want to go out there because we heard that this and that area may be vulnerable. So there was no large scale organization. It was not like all of Denmark or all of Norway went to war against this and that place. Uh, in the, the later, after the, the Viking period, it became a little more centralized, but at that time it was really mainly you know, a number of local leaders, you know, chieftains, jarls, local kings, etc. And uh, yeah, it was, it was diverse groups and equipment could of course vary regionally and uh, within that time period overall, etc., etc. So 
I'd say the main reason why games often deviate a lot from history, even when they have a presumably historical setting, is because actual historical Vikings are not that distinctive, really. You know, if, if you think about the Yermenbu helmet, the, the spectacle helmet is the most distinctive Viking thing, aside from the silly horned helmets, which of course were not historical at all. But that's, that's how you recognize a Viking, you know, round shield, painted round shield, that kind of spectacle helmet, and the sword. The swords are the most iconic and most recognizable, but the Anglo-Saxons had very similar swords. So, and the spectacle helmet, as I said, is this one case. So if you really want to stick to accurate Viking warriors, especially non-nobles, you know, lower class, your average Thorolf or whoever, didn't actually look that much different necessarily from warriors in other regions. So, yeah, of course you want to make the identity clear, uh, especially in games like For Honor, where it's this faction versus that faction. They have to be very distinctive and all of that. So, yeah, but there's a lot of weird stuff. Let's put it that way. And this is a really long video, isn't it? Anyway, so I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. Check out the links down below. Consider supporting me on Patreon or Subscribestar if you are so inclined. And uh, you can also follow me on Facebook and blah, whatever. There's a bunch of stuff there. Just check it out. <laughs> Have a good one, folks. May Thor be with you.